Um, Creative Assembly is, as a studio, 30 years old this year, so it's one of the longest running studios in the UK that's still making games. Um, and we're also one of the largest. We've got almost 500 members of staff uh, working on several projects. Uh, we've worked on console titles such as Alien Isolation and Halo Wars 2 that was released this year. And on the Total War team, we'll be releasing our 11th main Total War title. Um, so I work on the Total War team. Uh, Total War is a PC strategy game. Um, so I'll be taking sort of visual examples from our most recent release, Total War Warhammer, um, and the sequel to that will be released later this year. Um, so to give you an idea of sort of the art quality levels that we're hitting and sort of a little bit about what our game looks like, um, I've got a video of our old world edition. Total War Warhammer, a vast fantasy world that could be yours for the taking. Five races are at war. Who will you lead? The Empire of Men, brave, well-trained, with unstoppable cavalry. The savage greenskins, a brutal tide of fang and muscle. Stout dwarfs, all but unbreakable in battle and unmatched in close combat. Will you succumb to the dark bloodlust of the vampire counts? Ranks of undead infantry, without remorse or fear. Or lead noble Bretonia, the lords of chivalry, heraldic knights and peasant militia. Award-winning fantasy strategy on a scale you've never experienced. Choose your side and conquer this world. Cool, so um, Total War, whilst being a PC game, um, a lot of the techniques that I'll be talking about are not limited to the games we work on. They come on across AAA, whether that's console, PC. Um, it's all about improving the performance of the games. Um, the main thing that we have to be aware of as a PC developer is that you don't know what hardware players are gonna have. So we have more layers of optimization, but if you're interested in game development, then anything I talk about here isn't specific to our game, um, but is used across sort of the industry. Um, this image here um, shows various art roles within development. Um, so the dark purple ones are different types of artists, and the pale ovals are their responsibilities or what they'll work on in the game. Um, it's not to scale, but the bigger ovals are where we hire more artists. So we have a lot more environment artists than say concept and 2D. Um, so Total War is a game of two parts. We have a main campaign where the player um, controls their faction in meeting objectives, um, taking over the map um, and raising their army. Um, and then we have the battle side um, where you fight against opposing factions this is a tactical view. If you zoom out while you're playing battle, you can kind of see the entire playable area. So right between sort of the water and where we have the forest, the characters can sort of move around. This is a siege battle, so your objective as a player is to get into the city walls and fight the enemy. Um, in terms of optimization, when we're putting together a map, any area that the player can't get to, there's not a lot of point in us putting a lot of detail. So we'll focus our efforts on making the playable area as interesting as possible, whilst keeping it high performing. So when our environments work with the designers to put the art into a level, they'll be focused mainly on this main area um, where you're sort of playing the siege. Um, so as a player, you'll be confronting the main wall and then trying to get into the city. So 
UI artists, um, UI art is a role that is sometimes overlooked. Um, it's mostly a 2D art role, but it's also quite technical because they might need to understand how 3D works. And they also have to think a lot about how the player is going to interact with the, the game. Um, and it covers a lot of different things. It covers sort of the buttons that the player will have to interact with, also uh, the displays for any maps, um, anything that gives information to the player about what they should do, um, the labels for any places of interest, and also markers for where, where your armies are. Um, there's not a huge amount of optimization that they can do in terms of how they create their assets, uh, but they'll work with the programmers to find technical ways of sort of limiting how much the UI costs, because we, we have to see some UI elements at all times for the player to, to kind of know what to do, to be able to interact with the game. But they will try and find interesting ways of, of limiting that and not taking up too much space on screen. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting role in terms of thinking about the user's experience and how, how the user will be interacting with the game. Um, and these are various UI elements that we'll have in battle. Um, so it can be anything from labels to common menus, but also sort of iconography, letting you know sort of what are the different units in our battle. And then when you're looking at the battle itself, any icons that make it easy for you to understand what you should be attacking, who your, um, who your friendly um, units are, um, and then also um, as the enemy appears, being able to kind of see from a distance where they are so that you know where you're aiming. So character artists are in charge of making all the character models, um, any creatures, and also props and weapons that need to interact with the character's body. Um, they'll get concepts from the concept artists, and then they will sculpt a high resolution model, much like you would kind of sculpt in clay, but um, in 3D software. Um, they then bake that model down onto a game resolution model that's a lot lower poly, um, and we'll bake that detail into maps. Um, with Total War, as you saw, a lot of the time when you're playing battle, you might be zoomed out, so everyone's very small on screen. But you can also zoom in super close to your units. Um, so our character artists have to be really good at making anatomically correct, really nice looking characters. But they also go through an optimization process to make sure that runs fast when you're zoomed out and you want to see hundreds, if not thousands, of characters all animating on screen. So there we see, sort of zoomed out, you might have, say, 100 entities in each of the little units. There's also um, people inside the siege equipment. So once you've taken over the wall, you might have even more men coming on screen as they sort of get out and start hand-to-hand -hand combat. We also, when you're zoomed in, we want to give a sense that there are a lot of different people. They're not all the same. But obviously, we can't afford to sculpt hundreds of different heads for particular units. And especially with Total War Warhammer, there's a huge variety of different creatures that we need to sort of be cost effective with how we, um, how many different characters we create um, in order to meet deadlines. Um, and also so that we can load it all in memory. Um, so we'll try and find sort of clever ways of making it look like there's more uniqueness from sort of limited numbers of resources. So there's probably, with these guys at the front, there's probably about four different types of head, but we use things like hair tinting, um, we use mixing and matching, so one face might swap to use different helmets, we'll swap the different body parts, so we'll mix and match sort of different trousers with different um, shirts and so forth, so forth, so that when you're sort of like not looking too closely, sort of you get, you get the sense that there's a lot of different people there um, and it's not just the same guy over and over again. And then we go through a process called lodding. So creating the lods um, is all mostly an automated process. So we have tools that will analyze the geometry of the characters and will start to remove polygons where 
players can't see it um, as you zoom out. So um, in game, the further the character entity is away from the camera, the smaller it will be on screen, so the less detail we need to show. Um, for us, um, so this is our highest LOD. Um, this is the first bake down from the character artist's really nice sculpt um, onto a game model. Um, so this is the highest resolution in game. Um, and then we'll go down to our LOD1, which is pretty similar. Um, because we're a PC title and we need to deal with people with higher and lower spec machines, um, we will sort of drop um, graphic settings if somebody on a sort of several year old laptop wants to play and we need to concentrate on performance over visuals. But the LOD one's still pretty good looking. I mean, you can notice when you're flicking back and forth. But if you're playing with this, this guy, I mean, he looks pretty good. And then we start getting into the performance LODs. So LOD 2, we stop alpha testing. So um, alpha testing is where, rather than cut around the exact edge of objects, such as the feather, um, we'll have it on a flat plane, and then we'll use a texture to say whether we want to draw individual pixels. So we'll, we'll c keep the geometry as close to the edge of the area that we want to be drawn on screen, but then the texture will sort of do a, a black and white mask. So we'll mask out areas that we don't want to draw. So when we get sort of further away, and you sort of, you can't see the, where it's black currently, um, we stop alpha testing, um, and the geometries become a lot simpler. You can kind of tell there's a lot more straight edges here. We then go to our final performance LOD, and you, you can really tell here that um, it's, it, it's still the same character, but we've got rid of quite a bit of detail. He's lost his facial hair, and his legs are pretty straight now. So they'll have edge loops around the knees and elbows, so it can still bend and conform to the animation. But um, you'll probably find there's not individual fingers there. Um, everything's very simple. Um, and you'll only see this from a distance where it, it's kind of approximated to, you, you, you can tell who it is, but you, you wouldn't be able to tell from a distance that this is a low resolution model. Um, then because we have units with say 100 different um, characters in, we will swap the meshes completely so that every, uh, every person in that unit uses the same mesh so we don't have to calculate the geometry for sort of all the different variations. And we go to our super tiny guy. Um, because this is seen at quite a far distance and you're only really picking up sort of the general colors, um, and we've got sort of different variations, so we might have certain variants in that unit have their left arm red or, or their right arm red, um, but we'll kind of pick out what, what the most sort of uh, distinctive color is, um, and we'll sort of map that as a projection onto our super tiny mesh. And um, characters are pretty important for us in battle. They're, the, they're, they're essentially what you're playing with. So we want to be able to see them at all times. So we have an even lower resolution version for when you're really zoomed out. <laughs> and um, yeah, he's pretty cute. So uh, you, you could probably do a, a kind of retro version of Total War with just our super tiny guys. Um, and they're... Um, yeah, you, you never see these close to the camera, um, but there's very few triangles. They'll be sort of 50 or below. Um, in, in some of our games, we'll sort of go even, even further and kind of, they're literally kind of five pyramid-y bits. Um, and then to complement the characters, um, we have the animators who essentially kind of breathe life into the characters when they're moving on screen. Um, so for the cinematic trailer earlier, um, all the meshes were game assets, so we, we have a cinematic team in-house, um, and we have a series of cinematic animators, um, and the animations in the trailer earlier are probably the only thing that might have been um, specifically bespoke for the trailer. So when we release trailers, we want our players to be able to get a good impression of what the game is that they're buying. Um, so the VFX and all the meshes will be game assets, um, and it, it's really sort of the camera uh, and maybe the animation that will sort of change to show it off. 
to its best. Um, but we have a dedicated animation team that just focuses on the game animations. Um, they need to learn about timing and waiting. Um, and they also have their own loading process. So these guys are just doing um, idle animations. They're hanging around. Um, they're not engaged in combat. And they'll sort of randomly be playing animations throughout. So they'll all be playing an idle animation. But you can notice some guys cheering every so often. Um, as you zoom out and we see the characters from a distance, um, what we'll do is we'll decrease that random variation. So we'll get all of these guys to start playing the same animation. And we'll also reduce any sort of bespoke animation. So we'll only be playing sort of the simple idols. Um, we'll get rid of any of the cheers. So you'll see sort of more cool animations if you zoom in, but from a distance to reduce the amount of calculations we have to do. Um, everyone in each individual unit will play the same animation. Um, also in the game, to get animations to look good and also to share animations across different characters. We'll use um, splices or secondary animation, basically layering animations over the top of each other. So if we have an animation for a guy doing a sword attack, um, but we want them to do a spear attack, but the legs are pretty much doing the same animation, we'll just say, use this upper body animation um, and sort of paste it over the top. So we only have to have one set of leg animations, but we can have various upper body. But we also do that for things such, of, such as hand poses and facial animation, so that we don't need to bake sort of hands and faces into each individual animation. We can sort of paste that on over the top, um, and you can get sort of random facial expressions happening. And also, if a guy is always holding a sword, we just say, OK, put it in this pose and just keep that pose throughout the whole of their sort of lifetime. Um, that will also get turned off at a distance. So essentially sort of the hands and face will stop animating and it will go to a kind of a, a baked pose or if the mesh has sort of gone to a lower resolution where you can't see the fingers, we just won't animate those joints. So our environment artists are responsible for the terrain. They're also responsible for the buildings, the props any vegetation, and they also do world and set building. So as well as creating the 3D models, um, usually quite similar to how characters create their work, um, they have to put it in the scene and build up the levels. Um, so they work very closely with designers um, who will dictate sort of the strategic areas in which we sort of place environment assets. But they'll do a lot of set dressing to kind of make it atmospheric, make it look like it belongs to the faction who, whose area you're in. Um, so pretty much everything here that isn't characters and UI is part of the environment. Um, but we'll take a closer look at the city. Um, so this is the kind of view that you'd get if you were zooming, sort of flying over the city. Um, and this is a lodded version. So similar to characters, um, we lose all the detail. Um, all the tiny flags are gone. We also sort of get rid of any, any detail. Um, most of the windows tend to disappear. Um, the trees become a lot more simple. Um, and we lose a lot of detail. Most of the roofs are probably quite flat. Um, and all the spires are pretty much just like regular pyramids by now. Um, and it goes through a similar process to characters. So this is our sort of highest lod. So if you zoom in, um, this is what you'll see. Um, we'll then drop it to get rid of any detail that you wouldn't see at a distance. And then our final lod is pretty simple, all straight lines again. Um, and you can even see in some places we, we've got gaps, but it's, it's pretty small on screen. So these are the sort of distances that you'll see it at. Um, so you can actually zoom closer um, on the first model, um, but obviously it sort of, um, you can't fit it all on screen with the distances that we can get right in. Um, but it's sort of this distance on screen, it swaps to the next model, because um, you pretty much wouldn't be able to see um, any of the flags. And then at this distance, where things are only taking up a few pixels, we go to the smallest model. Um, we've got a lot less polygons to draw, um, and it's a lot cheaper. Um, 
so they're also responsible for vegetation. Uh, vegetation is also lodded, but they use a technique called billboarding. So this is our, um, our mesh lod. Um, we have lots of cards for trees. So we'll have um, leaves that are, the texture is on various planes. Um, and there's a lot of alpha testing. So rather than cut around each individual leaf, leaf um, we'll use textures to define sort of where the edges of leaves are. Um, and this is a billboard. So pretty much um, as you see it, it's a flat 2D image. And we use four projected images on an intersecting plane um, that replace um, our regular trees. So it essentially goes down into a sprite. Um, VFX is, especially for Warhammer, it's, it's, it's a big thing because it adds a lot of interest. Um, and we have a lot of magic in Warhammer as well. So we put a lot of effort into making things that look really cool. Um, so most games will have VFX artists um, and they'll do things like dust, uh, fire, water, um, a lot of things that aren't kind of solid. Um, and VFX artists have to be very technically minded. Um, they work a lot with particles and systems that um, rely heavily on sort of programmers continually optimizing and also improving it. Um, and it's, it's an area that we're sort of, it's continually developing and we're always taking um, techniques from film and other areas of 3D um, as hardware is improving. Um, but they also need to have an artistic eye um, because they need to make it look good. Um, there's no point in putting hundreds of thousands of particles into dust if the dust doesn't really look realistic. So um, sometimes you don't even notice the VFX. So things like dust or um, as characters are walking through water or mud um, and you sort of see things displace or, or kind of have an effect, um, they just kind of happen. Um, but we can also use it to highlight things of interest. So here where you see the plumes coming off these characters, these characters currently have buffs. So we can show that they have a game-specific effect applied to them. Um, so that at a distance, you as a player can, kind of, can go, OK, there's something special about these, these characters. Um, and down in the right-hand corner, we have our magic gauge. So you can spend your magic to give characters buffs. And you want to know sort of where you've spent that um, and be able to find those characters when they're in the middle of combat um, and everyone's sort of piled in on each other. Um, and here are various um, sort of VFX in action. Um, the fire on the sword. Um, I think we've got um, a hammer there. Um, and essentially, these systems are created from particles and also sprite sheets. So VFX artists also need to understand 2D because they kind of need to create sort of the fire effect um, in a simulation. But then that might get baked down to a sprite sheet. So they need to sort of understand the process of 2D. And then it gets played back in game to make it look like animation. And this is a VFX effect. Our artists have to be aware of the cost of particle simulators um, and the number of particles that are being generated. So if you imagine sort of we're playing 100 of those and each of those is splitting out sort of 10,000 particles, we've now got a million particles on screen um, and we're having to calculate all of those. So again, we'll load down the VFX. So we have a lot, at a distance, we have a lot fewer particles. Um, you kind of notice that the resolution, each particle is sort of bigger. Um, and we lose some of the definition in the center um, where you could kind of make out a shape of the VFX. But at a distance, you can still recognize what it's supposed to look like, what it's supposed to represent. But it's a lot cheaper. Um, technical artists um, essentially cover the area in between art and programming. So a lot of what we do as artists wouldn't be possible without programmers writing it into the system, 
to optimize and to do all our mess, mesh swapping um, and um, animation loading um, and play that back in game. Um, and technical artists are the bridge between artists and making sure that how the art artists want the visuals of the game um, to look like, um, what the artists have decided the sort of visual quality is. Um, they, technical artists help sort of translate that to programmers um, so that if we want to change anything with how the art works, we can describe the problem to a programmer um, and change the in-game system that controls that. Um, but technical artists also sort of understand how the programming systems um, work. Um, and we can also chat to the artists about what the technical constraints are. So we can find that middle ground in between so the game looks good, but also runs well. Um, so technical artists do a lot of um, tool development to improve the process. So with the LODs we saw earlier, um, we might build a tool like this, which allows us to set um, percentages or triangle counts or different methods um, to decrease the polygon count um, so that artists can play around with performance settings um, and regenerate LODs without having to sort of hand build each individual model. Um, but uh, one of the visual sort of areas that technical artists also look into are shaders. So again, with this image, um, sort of all the bits such as fire and the effects that sort of go outside of the realm of the mesh are controlled by VFX. Um, but uh, on the left, we have a bright wizard um, and his hair and arms currently have um, an emissive shader on. Um, the same with the emblem um, on the guy in the middle. Um, that glowing effect is being controlled by a shader. Um, what we can do as artists is um, shaders are kind of a mathematical function that describes how something should look um, and how something should look over time as well. Um, so this is one of our um, ghostly shaders. So we use various textures to describe pattern, the pattern that scrolls here. Um, we can describe the speed that we want it to scroll. Um, there's a distortion on it. Um, shaders can also control things like um, vertex animation. So the leaves on our trees will blow in the wind. Um, or we can change how things react to light. So we can get things to glow at the edge, uh, at their edges. Um, and we can also do random tinting. Um, so depending on what your, um, your faction colors are, we can change the color of your clothes. Um, so rather than have individual characters for, say, you want a green version or a red version or a yellow, um, we just change it in the shader and say, tint this yellow, tint this red. Um, so our shaders um, can also be lotted. So when we go down to the lowest mesh, we basically just have a static glow on it that will be sort of the approximate color. Um, and it won't have any of the scrolling effects, um, but from a distance, it still looks virtually the same. So yeah, all those techniques are things that are commonly found in games. Um, and those are, those are things that the artists need to be aware of um, when they're developing their games. Obviously, there's a lot more that goes on in the background um, with our gameplay programmers and especially on the graphic side in terms of optimization. 